broadcast and we are beginning the broadcast and we are beginning live on Facebook one second please join Oops. one second everybody will be starting in just one moment all right this is a little go live anyway we're just going to do that and we're going live Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to give everybody just a few moments to log in. The attendees are just filtering into the broadcast now. And for those um, watching live on Facebook, we will be streaming from the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association official Facebook page. And this meeting will be recorded and will be disseminated via email and put on our YouTube site as well to be viewed later for anybody who could not join us live. So welcome everybody to this presentation. We are going to be discussing the hypertrophic cardiomyopathies patient focused drug development meeting to be held on April 27th, 2020. This meeting is for patients, caregivers, and all those with HCM, as well as industry, FDA, and those with the professional care of those with HCM, we're gonna ask them to join in with us as well. But it's primarily a meeting for patients. During this webinar, we are going to be speaking for about 45 minutes about what is a patient-focused drug development meeting and how you can participate either in person or from a distance. The PFDD planning team includes myself, Lisa Salberg, founder and CEO of the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association, Gwen Mays, who's gonna introduce herself in a moment, and James Valentine and Larry Brower, I'm sorry if I said that wrong, who are with Hyman Phelps and McNamara, which is an, a law firm out of DC, and they have great experience in conducting PFDD meetings, and they're going to uh, explain to you what the meetings are all about. So before we begin with their presentation, I wanna introduce Gwen. And Gwen, can you tell us a little bit about your background and why you're interested in helping us with this particular project today? Great, thanks Lisa. And hello everyone. Um, it's very nice to meet you, at least live here through voice, face, mail, and on this webinar. So my name is Gwen Mays and I'm serving as a consultant to Lisa and the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association as we've been planning for several months and we'll come through with the patient-focused drug development meeting that you're gonna hear more about. My role is one that I consider a great honor and very special to me for a variety of reasons. Lisa and I have known each other and worked sort of tangentially for about 15 years now. I've been in DC for most of my adult career, both as a cardiothoracic PA working in the clinical area, but also as an attorney working in policy and advocacy work. This event and this meeting is of particular importance to me in that I've lived my entire life with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I was diagnosed as a young woman. I was not given a very good prospect of living very long. So I have, and speaking with many of you that are hopefully on the call or watching, understand the symptoms, the burden of this disease, the life changes that it can bring about. And it's through that lens that I hope to work with you in helping you tell your stories, understand the questions, and make sure that the patient's voice gets provided to others so they can learn about this condition. So it's really great. Thank you, Lisa. I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you, Gwen. So <clears throat> I'm going to turn over the presentation and uh, the controls in just a second to um, Larry and James, who are going to take over the presentation from this point on. And I'm going to give the mouse, nope, I'm sorry, I think I did that wrong. Um, no, I, I'm still, whoop, Larry, I'm gonna take that back, <laughs> sorry. Um, hold on, let me. You guys want to give your screen, correct, Larry? I'm sorry. Yes, we can. I think we can control the slides now. Can you? Okay, try. Yes, you can. Okay, continue. Yes, okay. Larry and James, it's on you now. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you, uh, Lisa and, and Lisa and Gwen. It's been so great to get to work with you. This is James Valentine here, and I'm 
here with my colleague Larry Bauer. We're with Heinrich Phelps and McNamara. Uh, we're a uh, food and drug law regulatory group in Washington, D.C., uh, working with patient organizations uh, like HCMA uh, to help uh, engage with and navigate uh, the Food and Drug Administration and um, help ensure that your patient's community voice is uh, both understood and incorporated into decisions by regulatory decision makers, as well as uh, drug developers, those that are um, researching and developing th uh, new therapies for your condition. Uh, Larry and I both come to this with an experience, um, both having worked at the Food and Drug Administration. Um, I worked as a patient liaison at the agency for a number of years, helping incorporate the patient voice into the agency's decision making from within the FDA. And Larry was there working within uh, the group that he helped found, which was the Rare Diseases Program uh, within the Center for Drugs. So really working on cross-cutting issues that affect rare diseases uh, including working with patient communities um, that uh, are rare in nature. Um, you know, we both have uh, a, a strong commitment to, to this type of work, um, have done a number of, uh, have helped plan and moderate in two-thirds of the 30-plus externally-led patient-focused drug development meetings that have been held to date, and so are really looking forward to sharing with you some background to help set the stage uh, for this upcoming patient-focused drug development meeting on April 27th. We wanted to kind of start out just with a, a little bit of, you know, orienting you, why am I on this webinar, why am I, should I be thinking about this meeting before we dive into any of the educational content. Um, really, you know, what is the purpose of a, this PFDD meeting, of really any patient-focused drug development meeting? You know, this is an opportunity for you, patients and, and caregivers of patients with HCM, to educate the Food and Drug Administration about what it's like to live with your condition, what concerns that you have as your condition progresses, uh, what are the different treatment approaches that you employ to help manage your condition, and give us a sense of helping understand how well those things are working and what the downsides are. And then really, uh, what are your treatment goals? Short of a cure for your disease, what would a meaningful therapy look like? These are important topics, and we're going to break them down uh, later on in the, the presentation for you. Uh, but these are areas where you, as the patient or as the caregiver of a patient, are really experts and can help FDA understand these things. So why should you participate? Well, this is a really unique opportunity um, you know, over the, there's only been, uh, I think, 32 externally led meetings. You know, there's over 7,000 known rare diseases and then many more, more common or prevalent conditions. So you can imagine that this is a really um, great opportunity and a unique opportunity where FDA is going to be focused on your condition, on HCM, uh, for a day. And so this is a unique opportunity to have your voices heard by FDA. FDA, of course, being the federal agency that approves all treatments uh, or potential treatments for HCM. And so it's important for them to know what is important for you in order to help them make more informed decisions. And not only will this information help them make decisions at the time of consider <laughs> considering whether to approve a drug, this will also help them uh, in their decision making throughout all of drug development, including uh, designing trials that you or your peers may be participating in. So why now? Well, you know, patient-focused drug development is only a, a fairly uh, new program um, in the last six to seven years or so. Um, Prior to that, you know, the patient's voice had historically been absent from drug development. It was really only when a problem arose that FDA or a drug developer or an academic researcher would reach out to a patient or a patient organization to try to, to help troubleshoot. You know, maybe it was because it was, you know, the, the result of a study. We didn't know if it was actually going to be meaningful for a patient um, when the results read out or maybe a trial was having some difficulty uh, in enrolling, and there was a 
question of why that might be. Why, why aren't patients volunteering to be in this study? Well, rather than troubleshoot, FDA recognized and through many of its own experiences, um, came to the realization that engaging with patients early in the process can help uh, avoid those types of issues. And so wanted a more systematic and proactive way to hear voices from different patient communities um, to help inform you know, these types of decisions. And so really patient-focused drug development has become a priority at FDA. Um, it's why they've participated in so many of these meetings over a relatively short period of time. And in our own en engagement with HCMA and with the FDA, you know, there's a great deal of enthusiasm for this meeting and to hear from all of you. So for today's presentation, you know, uh, now that you have a little bit of a sense of why this is a very important meeting, um, we wanted to kind of uh, start out giving you a foundation in what might be useful, whether you're considering and participating in the meeting, or if you know you're participating, but you just want some more information to help prepare you. Um, this webinar is intended to give you that, that information and information at a few different levels. We're going to start out with a high-level overview of, of FDA and how drug development works, give you a sense of that um, overall framework. Um, we're then going to build on that and talk about where the patient voice really fits in to that decision-making process within the context of this program that's called patient-focused drug development. Um, we'll then third drill down and actually talk about how you'll be able to participate in the meeting the different formats and agenda of the meeting, the different ways that you can be a part of the meeting, whether in person or by web, and give you other logistical and important information that you'll need. So to go ahead and jump right into our first topic, we're going to go into kind of our FDA and Drug Development 101. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through a series of slides here that take you through the different stages or steps of drug development. These may be terms that you've heard before. Maybe you didn't know exactly where they fit into the overall timeline or life cycle of uh, drugs being developed, just so that way when we then talk about where the patient voice fits in, you'll have a good sense of why it's important early and often throughout development. It also might help demystify the process a little bit for you. So at the very beginning of this um, life cycle of, of drug development is drug discovery. This is a stage before you know, a product is even really being researched in a disease where you're looking to try to find different compounds or different therapeutic modalities that can have an input into a disease progress process. So when you hear about basic science research, the kind of research often that NIH is doing or funding, um, this is to help understand you know, how we might you know, learn about diseases to be able to intervene and hopefully help treat or prevent those diseases. So during this stage, lots of different compounds are screened, and eventually, hopefully, what happens is a compound or a, a technology is identified that might, uh, you know, based off of what's known scientifically, be able to, to help stop or prevent a disease process. Once researchers identify that promising compound, um, then we move into the later stages of development, which is kind of really, um, you know, what, what we refer to when we say drug development. The first stage, though, before uh, of development is at a preclinical stage. And this really, you know, it starts at the beginning, but it really gets carried through the timeline as well. Um, this is work that's done before that new drug or biological product is ever tested in humans, which is why we use the term preclinical, you know, pre-human. Uh, the primary goal here is to test this in uh, essentially laboratory models or animal models um, to understand if the product is reasonably safe for initial use in humans. If there are different models of the disease, whether that be in a, a chemical assay or again in an animal model, we also want to look to see if we can uh, show that the product has some effect in that model of the disease. So that if way we have some sense that it might actually uh, have a, a treatment benefit for patients when it moves into, the, into humans. Um, at the end of this, this is uh, an important stage of development. Um, once this preclinical work hits a certain uh, milestone, 
Um, then that information is provided to the Food and Drug Administration and what's called an Investigation New Drug Application, or IND. Um, and this is what uh, allows FDA to review all of that information to make sure that the product is safe and has a, a good enough rationale to move into humans, as well as for uh, FDA to review the first in human clinical trials uh, protocol or design. So in that IND submission, it con contains all of that uh, animal and, and laboratory information, which is uh, described as pharmacology and toxicology studies. Um, I kind of described what that meant uh, in, la in lay terms on the last slide. It also provides information on how the product is manufactured, and again, the proposal for how the product will be tested in the first study in humans. That first study in humans is often a phase one study. Um, the idea here is that we're trying to understand the drug safety in a very small number of people. Um, sometimes, not always in rare diseases, this is um, done in healthy volunteers, so not actually individuals with the condition. Um, here we're trying to understand what are the most common side effects of the drug, how does the drug really you know, get metabolized and excreted in the body, is it getting to the target tissues that it needs to get to to have its effect. Um, you know, that way we can make sure that the product has the highest chance of, of success while uh, minimizing any potential for uh, serious safety. If all goes well there and, and we have a, a reasonable safety profile um, based off of that limited amount of exposure, we then move into phase two. This uh, is typically the first uh, type of clinical trial that is in individuals with the condition, so it's our first study in the disease itself. Um, here we now are placing emphasis on how well the drug works, its effectiveness. Um, we want to make sure that it's, you know, actually uh, having some impact on the disease in people. Um, we often are comparing this drug against the control in phase two. Um, this is most commonly a placebo control, so the sugar pill. Um, you know, to, to be able to ascertain whether the treatment effect is due to the product or if it's due to a you know, the, the kind of well, I think, understood placebo effect. Um, and we're continuing here to monitor short-term side effects and other safety issues. So this is kind of the middle ground trial. It's a little longer. It's a little bigger. It's establishing really the proof of concept that the product works. Again, if all goes well, then we move into phase three of clinical development. Um, here, these are kind of our, our tr uh, more traditional, um, you know, large-scale randomized placebo-controlled trials. Often, um, there's different types of controls, different types of designs, but that's kind of the, the traditional design of a study. Um, this is where we're really trying to prove the hypothesis or test the hypothesis that the drug is effective. We have now the largest number of patients. We're following patients for a longer period of time. Um, and, you know, we may even be testing different doses and, uh, in, in this type of study, uh, but we're really trying to evaluate whether the drug has the treatment effect that we believe that it should have based off of the phase two studies. Of course, safety evaluation continues, um, and we're also looking at the effect in different populations. We now have a large enough, usually, um, clinical trial size and not enough people in the study to look at differences between, for example, men versus women, you know, different ethnicities, maybe different severity of disease coming into the trial. We're looking at all of those things to help make sure we understand what the drug's treatment effect is and the safety of the drug. And it may take more than one of these trials um, in order to give us confidence in that treatment effect. Uh, once clinical development uh, concludes, after you have um, demonstrated both uh, that there is benefit and that you understand the risk profile, um, a uh, developer will submit what's called a new drug application for a drug or a biologic license application for a biologic, that's the NDA or BLA. Um, that's the marketing application. That's what, if approved, allows a company to market the drug and sell the drug in the United States. So often, uh, we'll, the drug developer will meet with FDA 
uh, to have a pre-NDA meeting. The idea here is just review the data that exists, understand what gaps there may be, if any, um, that would help or of what FDA would need to be able to review and make a decision about whether to approve a drug. Um, it also is an opportunity if, if there is enough information to discuss how that information will be analyzed and packaged so that way FDA can review it uh, in an efficient manner. And this includes everything. The NDA or BLA includes all the information from all those uh, earlier phases of development that you see on the left of the, the orange NDA filing chevron at the bottom. Once that NDA is uh, submitted and FDA determines that it's complete and files that NDA, then FDA assigns a review team. This is uh, a multidisciplinary review team. It includes clinicians. It includes experts in, in pharmacology and toxicology, biostatistics. Um, if it's a rare disease, rare disease team can be involved in that. Um, and FDA is looking to assess whether effectiveness has been demonstrated. Um, so FDA will have only seen some of the data uh, in like that pre-NDA meeting, but now it gets access to all of the data and can run its own analyses on the data, really pressure test it to see if what the true effectiveness of the drug is. Similarly, look at the safety profile of the drug and then once those two things have been established, FDA weighs whether the benefits of the drug um, are, are greater than the risk. And if so, then it can approve the drug. Importantly, in addition to benefit and risk, FDA is looking at manufacturing quality to make sure that products are, are manufactured in a high quality and consistent fashion. You want to make sure that whatever the drug is that you're getting is actually what it's intended to be, that you get the right dose every time, you don't get a, a sub-therapeutic or you don't get an overdose, um, and that there's not impurities that could be harmful. So that's an important part of FDA's review as well. And FDA can take that, uh, these review issues to an external committee of experts called an advisory committee to provide their input in a non-binding fashion. Uh, if FDA then approves the drug, uh, the drug is then on the market, but FDA's job is not finished. They are involved in post-market safety surveillance. So uh, FDA is constantly learning about uh, drugs as they're being marketed and continues to have regulatory oversight. Uh, clinical trials, by definition, are brief in duration. And, and uh, if you've ever looked to try to see if you can enroll in a trial, you know that there's a lot of inclusion and exclusion criteria for clinical trials. So they're, they're also, by definition, more limited or uh, patient <clears throat> populations than the broad patient population that might actually be able to use the drug on the market. And so because of that, um, we're going to, as we broaden use and use the drug for longer, we're going to learn more about the safety of the drug. And so that information goes to FDA, and FDA maintains a program to help monitor and if necessary, take action against drugs that are on the market. So I talked a lot here about, you know, how the drug moves through drug development and all of these different activities the uh, different uh, clinical trials, non-clinical studies, those are all done, um, you know, by the drug developer, which is usually a pharmaceutical or biotechnology company. So I want to talk a little bit about what exactly FDA's role is, which is important because FDA is our primary audience for this PFDD meeting. So drug development and clinical trials, FDA is not the party that's actually developing drugs. It's again, the researchers, the pharmaceutical companies, even nonprofit groups sometimes will conduct this type of research to help evaluate the safety and effectiveness of drugs. Also, FDA is not the one conducting any of the individual clinical trials. Um, FDA isn't on site for the clinical trials. It's really the researchers and the developers that are doing the trials, although they do have to seek FDA input and approval before starting those trials. So uh, throughout development, the companies or, or other researchers are going in and submitting their research plans to FDA for review. Uh, I 
another area, this is an area where F FDA is not involved, which is in the practice of medicine and drug costs. So FDA does not have the authority to regulate the practice of medicine. FDA regulates drug companies and drug marketing, but not healthcare providers. They don't regulate doctors or nurses or pharmacists. Uh, doctors or any other prescriber is free to prescribe an FDA-approved drug for other conditions that aren't FDA-approved. This is known as off-label use. This is not something that FDA has the ability to regulate. The other area that FDA does not regulate is the price of medicine. So consideration of drug prices is not part of FDA's regulatory mandate. Um, FDA can't base any approval decision based off of what the drug price might be in the future. And actually, FDA doesn't even have that information or get that information during its review. Um, that all being said, FDA does play a role in helping facilitate drug development. Part of its dual mission is to help promote the public health. You know, these FDA reviewers, they, they've seen what works, what doesn't work. They've seen a lot. And so they have a lot of expertise and knowledge to help share um, from across all of their uh, experience doing reviews. And so with that experience, FDA does provide technical help to researchers and developers. They help companies design trials and studies, and they do meet you know, throughout the whole process to help share that input, although ultimately you know, it's up to the researcher or developer to decide what the final study will look like. Um, this is all supported through user fees, which FDA is able to collect because of this law that says you're on the site, the Prescription Drug User Fee Act. Um, that happens to also be the same law that provided resources for FDA to do patient focused development. So I know we've given you a lot of information about uh, how FDA regulates drugs and biologics. Um, there's a lot more information that we could share with you, and there's actually a good resource website on FDA's website that, uh, where you can go and review this information in more detail, and that's provided here on the slide fda.gov forward slash for patients. So I'm now going to ask my colleague Larry Bauer to give you an introduction of where the patient voice fits into that process. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so once again, we'll visit, revisit again what's the purpose of having one of these meetings. Um, so the way this process started, uh, a number of years ago, the FDA wanted to develop a more systematic way to gather the patient perspective about different conditions and available treatment options. So they came up with this idea of having patient-focused drug development meetings, and they actually um, conducted about 26 of those meetings, and they realized that this is a really great way to get information. and but they realized they couldn't do these meetings for every disease that's out there. So they turned it over to patient advocacy groups and said, you guys lead the meetings. We'll kind of help out on the side, but you, you do these meetings. And the, the meetings help inform the understanding that the FDA review staff has of, like, of the benefit or risk assessment and the decision-making for new drugs. That's some of what James had talked about earlier. Um, and patient input helps the FDA during drug development and the review of an application for a new drug. So this is a little bit more about that benefit risk assessment. So when a new drug, a company develops a drug, they come to the FDA for the FDA to review it. The FDA either says, yes, we're going to approve this drug or no, we're not going to approve the drug. And if they say yes, the, 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 what you have to prove to the FDA is that this drug is safe, that there's no serious side effect, or if there is a side effect, there's a way to deal with it, and also that it does what it's gonna, it says it's going to do. So if a drug says it's going to treat pain in the label, they want to make sure that there's research studies that show that, yes, this drug actually does help pain. Um, and if you look at the bottom three bullets, that's the be this is this actually this slide diagrams exactly what an FDA reviewer does. It goes through each of these five areas and evaluates them to, to determine whether or not they want to approve the drug. So the, the bottom three, the benefit, the risk, and the risk management, that information all comes from the clinical trials that James had talked about. 
you know, th th that's where they can look at the data to see if there, what are the benefits, what are the risks, and how do you manage the risks. But the first two, the analysis of the condition and the current treatment options, this is where the FDA learns about what is the disease that the drug is supposed to treat, what other options are out there, are there any other drugs that patients can use instead of this new one, and these two areas are where uh, a patient-focused drug development can be incredibly important because hearing directly from patients and from caregivers, that's where you can really learn about a, a disease and, and about the current things that people are actually using to treat that disease and how well those things are working. So, the voice of the patient. This is the, one of the outcomes of the meeting. Uh, it's a framework for discussion questions. They came from the FDA's benefit risk framework and they represent important considerations in their decision making, as I just talked about. Um, and FDA emphasizes that active patient involvement and participation is the key to the success of these meetings. And the voice of the patient, you'll see that term again and again, the voice of the patient is the report that we write up at the end of the meeting that captures all the information, information about the disease from, from experts about the disease, as well as everything that the patients and caregivers said during the meeting. And it's all put together into one document that can be, um, <clears throat> that's kept in the public domain so anyone can read this document. Um, so, as I said, it's a summary of all the, art, the, the audience and caregiver testimony, as well as um, during the meeting, there's polling questions where people in the room at the meeting, as, whether, as well as people that are attending on the webinar, can answer polling questions by using their um, their cell phone or their computer, and we collect information in real time. Um, there's also discussion that happens during the meeting where uh, the, the moderator of the meeting will ask everybody in the room that, that has the condition to, to participate in a discussion about different topics. And this voice of the patient report, it's a key communication to the FDA review staff as well as industry, so people developing drugs, about what patients and caregivers most want to see in a new treatment. So FDA wants this information and they want it to inform them about ways to develop meaningful treatments. So the, the next section, we're gonna talk a little bit about how people participate <coughs> in the meeting. Great, thank you, Larry. So. Um, now diving into kind of the, the, the next layer, peeling the, the layers off the onion here, we talked about drug development, we talked about how the patient voice really is important to FDA to help inform that. Well, how are we actually going to accomplish that at this meeting? Uh, well, we uh, here are some kind of you know, high levels of meeting logistics. So, you know, who is this meeting for? Well, the participants, the experts that we're convening are really the HCM patients and care caregivers, you know, loved ones, parents, siblings, children, um, if you're someone that, you know, provides direct care for someone with HCM, you're who we want to hear from. Individuals with HCM, you're who we want to hear from. Our other audiences are there to listen and learn. That includes FDA staff as well as pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies um, that may be interested or may be actively developing therapies for HCM. Uh, as you know, this is on April 27th. Uh, we've got the, the uh, you know, uh, greater part of a day set aside uh, for these activities. We'll be convening at the College Park Marriott Hotel and Conference Center in Hyattsville, Maryland, just down the street from FDA's campus to help encourage, um, you know, great involvement and participation by FDA staff, uh, which we already have a, a good signal from registration so far that FDA is very eager uh, to be there and attend this meeting. Um, you can participate either in person or online via the live webcast. We'll talk more about that momentarily. So the agenda itself, just to give you an idea of what the meeting actually looks like, uh, the core of the meeting is really focused on hearing from you, patients and caregivers. 
There will be some welcoming and introductory comments, both from the HCM Association as well as from FDA. Uh, we will also have some background on HCM and clinical trials from a, uh, a clinical expert in the condition. We, uh, before we hear from patients, we want to make sure that you know all of the FDA staff have the same grounding in the underlying science and, and biology of HCM. So that way they can really appreciate where you're coming from when you're describing your symptoms and health effects of the condition. We'll then dive into really what is the meat of the meeting, which is organized into two overarching topics, the exact topics that Larry spoke to as being the, the two areas that set context for FDA's benefit risk decisions. One is understanding how HCM symptoms and health effects affect your life. And second, how uh, you manage your symptoms and getting a kind of an assessment of those approaches to treatment, as well as your preferences for a future treatment. Um, these topics, uh, as alluded to, will be include a patient panel, as well as polling questions and a moderated discussion with the audience. And once we complete doing that for each of the two topics, uh, we will conclude with some summary and closing remarks. Uh, in terms of what we actually will be covering within those two topics, we want to share with you some of the questions that are asked. Um, so this will give you a, a kind of a, a framework for how to think about what you might share. You know, look at these questions as I read through them. Think about what experiences do I have? What would I answer? Importantly, what examples could I share? from my own experience that would help paint a picture for FDA to really understand what it is that I've, I've lived with or is worried about. So on the first topic, which relates to living with the disease and understanding the disease symptoms and impacts, we're going to ask you about the symptoms and health effects that are having the most significant impact on your life. So this isn't just asking about what are all of the things that impact you, but actually you tell us what is having the greatest burden in your life. We want to kind of understand how those burdens might be different from a best day versus your worst day, um, a, a picture of that to help us understand the variability that you experience um, in the, the symptoms of the disease. And importantly, you know, not just what are the important symptoms, but how do those impacts, what are the downstream impacts in your life? What activities that are important to you are you not able to do or do as fully because of your HCM. Also within this topic, we're going to ask about how symptoms change over time. We know that things, uh, the, the condition can, can change and progress, so we want to know about how, um, that, how that has changed over time. And we also know that you know, some aspects of the disease might be yet to come. And so we really want to understand what are your fears or worries or frustrations about your condition, thinking about the future. Then we're going to build on this, this, that topic once we have that good foundation in understanding the disease itself and the patient experience with the disease and what patients are reporting, what you are reporting as being the greatest burdens of the disease. And then we're going to try to establish what are current challenges to treating those issues. So what is it that you're doing to manage your symptoms? This could be drugs. This could be other medical procedures. <coughs> this could be uh, things outside of traditional healthcare, even diet, exercise, or even lifestyle modifications. Very broadly defined, you know, ways to manage. We want to know how well those things are working. What are the most significant downsides to those things? Whether that be um, side effects, whether that be you know burden of time or travel or or the way that the product is administered. And we kind of want to really understand what you view as the downsides. And then once we've established that, which helps establish in large part what unmet needs that you have that still need to be addressed by treatment, we're going to ask you to help prioritize and, and present your treatment goals for the future. And short of a complete cure, what specifically <coughs> excuse me, would you look for in an ideal treatment? <coughs> so as I uh, alluded to, uh, the discussion format will consist of three primary ways to hear your input. The first um, is going to be hearing from a panel of patients. These are patients that will be uh, patients and caregivers will be selected to, as 
as much as possible to represent um, a number of different experiences with the condition, uh, but really are there to help set the foundation for the discussion, uh, provide a, kind of an overview that we'll be building upon throughout the rest of the day. In addition, we'll have a series of polling questions uh, that will give us a sense people in the room can use their phones or tablets, people who are following online on the webcast can use their PCs at home to answer these questions live. We'll see the results in the room. It'll give us a sense of the different experiences of people that we have and some of your kind of top line inputs. We'll use both the panel discussion as well as the polling questions to set the stage for really the uh, kind of the culmination of everything, which is the audience discussion. This is where all of our patients and caregivers that are participating in the meeting as part of the audience will share their experiences. Um, we, <coughs> I, as the moderator, will be asking questions, inviting people to raise your hand and answer those discussion questions that we walked through earlier. So this is where FDA will get to hear from a wide range of people representing the whole range of the disease. So I want to leave you with some tips for effective participation to think about now that you've heard so much about um, drug development, FDA's role, <coughs> where your voice fits in. Um, remember those things. Remember where FDA does play a role. You know, there are the audience. There's going to be many things in, that are part of your experience as a patient or as a caregiver that might be important to you but are just out of scope for the meeting. The way to make sure that you're within scope besides going back and looking at this webinar to remind yourself you know, what it is that FDA is looking at and evaluating is really to look at the discussion questions. The discussion questions, if you focus on that and answer those questions, you'll be able to really um, help answer the, the types of, or help educate FDA on the types of things that they need to hear. Um, if you have something important to share and you're participating in this meeting, you know, I do, uh, we ask that you would uh, try to relate it to the most appropriate topic or panel. So for example, if you really want to share an experience with the treatment that, uh, that you've tried, um, save that for the second topic when we then are asking about treatment because we really want to spend the time in the morning, in the first part, understanding uh, the disease experience. Um, and that, that applies to even some of the specific discussion questions. Look through those. We will get through those discussion questions. So try to think about which questions are most important to you uh, to be able to share your responses to. I think it's important to uh, uh, iterate here that it's okay to express feelings or experiences that were already voiced. I really don't want you to think that because maybe a panelist said something or another audience member said something that's already been said, it is really important for FDA and for <coughs> the drug developers to know where there are common experiences. Um, that being said, if you do have that type of experience, you know, put your own personal take on it. Share a unique perspective or an example that's specific to you to help, you know, add more color, make it make it more robust. Uh, there's going to be many voices in the room. Uh, we're going to try to hear from as many of you as possible on each of these different topics. So we ask that you keep your comments concise and focused. Um, you know, there's going to be many voices again. You know, by the nature, you saw the questions. This is, of course, an emotional topic, uh, but you know, please try to to be concise and focused so that way, out of respect for your peers, so that way we can hear as many people as possible. And you should know that there will be a way to send additional comments after the meeting. So you don't have to try to get everything, squeeze everything into that period of time. Um, there will be a way. All of those comments will be part of the record will be summarized and included in that voice of the patient report that Larry talked about. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Lisa to talk through some of the specific uh, logistics for the meeting. <clears throat> Hi, thanks so much for being so specific on all of this. I'm going to steal your controls back. Okay, so we've gotten a lot of information and I know webinars, when you've been on them for a while, they can start to um, get a little long. So we're going to be wrapping up here in just a few minutes. So we're going to talk about how you can participate in the discussion. And as you've heard, there are two ways that you're going to be able to participate. 
you're going to be able to be there in person, in the room with us, sharing your comments, and that will be incredibly impactful. We have a uh, space for 140 in the room. So if you're going to sign up to join us, please do so soon. Space is limited in the room itself. By webcast, we will be um, able to have up to 1,000 participants, I believe is our top number. Um, so we're hoping to get as close to that as possible. While um, you may not be able to travel and you might not be able to be there, we're asking that you take the day off of work or talk to the boss and see if you can participate at the webinar while you're at work, but ask for permission first, please. Um, the responses that you give in person or on the webcast through the technology that will be available, those responses to the system are private and confidential. We won't be tagging your name to a particular response. The information will be used specifically in the aggregate. If you would like to register for the meeting, you can register from the HCMA uh, homepage of our website at 4hcm.org and just visit the events link. It was way easier than just putting the, the link up here because it's really long. So just pop on there, go to the events page, you'll see the event, you can sign up and it will ask you if you're planning on participating in person or if you're participating in, uh, online. If you're participating online, you will be sent a link to the meeting a few days in advance so that you can just log in from any computer or phone or whatever technology you have. You can uh, submit comments with answers to the questions up to 30 days after the meeting. So after the meeting is presented and those people who are on site or those people who are watching in real time, they're gonna be able to give their answers right away. But we're gonna keep the meeting open for 30 days after the actual meeting so that if a family member wants to sign in after you've already seen it and said, hey, it's really important that you provide some input for us, you can send them to the meeting and they can share their stories and it will become part of the report there as well. If you have any questions regarding the responses or anything about the meeting, you can email us at support at 4hcm.org and we will be more than happy to answer any questions that you have and submit all of that information to our writer who will put it in the voice of the patient, patient report that will eventually be submitted to the FDA. Um, I'm sure somebody's gonna ask me, when is that report going to be submitted? So we're going to have the meeting. We're gonna keep everything open for 30 days. We're going to do our first write and then probably have some edits and it'll go back and forth. So we're probably looking at between 90 and 120 days after the meeting that that report will end up getting submitted to the FDA. So you have some time if you leave the meeting and you have this epiphany that you didn't say something, you can get in touch with us and we can add it to the report. So you must register in advance, whether you're gonna be in person or online, you must register in advance. I cannot guarantee that there will be any on-site registration because room is limited and you will not get the link if you don't register. So you have to register. You go to 4hcm.org. Um, I'm gonna show you on the next screen how you can actually register. Um, you will receive a login link the day of the webcast. So if you show up on the HCMA website and you, you know your login and your member number, you can log in and you can use it. For this particular meeting, this is a free meeting. There's no discount codes associated with it. So if you're not logged in, it's not a problem to just use this down here, the public registration button, and you can register that way. So those are the two ways to do it. You can log in or you can just go to public registration. And this is what the page will look like and it'll take you deeper into the website from there. If you'd like to attend in person, again, space is limited. We have a block of rooms available that are held for the meeting until um, April 4th. They're held uh, in the, in the, um, hi, the block of, of rooms. So if you wanna stay over with us, uh, HCMA staff will be getting there on Sunday and we will be setting everything up for Monday and then we will be leaving Monday uh, after the meeting. We will also be conducting something that's not in this presentation. We will have an audio visual team there to capture some video clips of your life with HCM so that we can use them in future uh, efforts and projects that we're working on. So um, if you're coming, please come camera ready because we would like you to share your story if you're so willing 
on film so that we can use it to raise awareness about HCM in the future. Um, the third bullet here is probably, to me, the most important bullet. Your participation is invaluable. We need your stories. They can only hear from leadership at the HCMA so much. They need to hear what's going on on the ground in your own words. We need everybody to share their own experience of the burden of disease, what treatments you've had to navigate, and what your hopes are. So please, please, please participate at whatever level you can. Registration to attend will be closed on April 17th. And if for any reason after you've registered you need to cancel, please do notify us so that we can keep an active tally. And if there's somebody who cancels from uh, physical participation in the room, somebody else might be wanting that space. So please uh, think about that in advance. Travel information, there are a number of room blocks available. The rate is 179. Uh, after registering for the event on the HCMA page, it'll take you right to the block and you can make your registrations there. Uh, reservations, I'm sorry, there. Um, that rate is good up until April 6th. So please do make sure that you register and uh, that you get your rooms booked. If you're flying in, Reagan or BWI are your closest airports. If you're traveling by train, it's Union Station. Um, if you're traveling by ground and you're not quite sure how to navigate from Union Station to get there, just write to us and we will give you the ground instructions. If you're a a metro kind of person, you can take the metro to get closer. Uh, we can lead you to car services as well. You can use Uber or Lyft as well. So there's a number of different options available for ground transportation. Um, if you have questions, you need assistance, the webinar will be on Facebook. It's there right now. We will also be putting it on the HCMA YouTube channel. You can contact the office at any time at support at 4hcm.org or call us, I didn't put the number here, but it's 973-983-7429. And any of our staff will be more than happy to assist you. Um, there was something else that I thought of, but it just slipped my mind, sorry. Um, again, just to summarize everything, I thank you, um, Gwen, Larry, and James for this great presentation today. I will try to see if there's any Q and A's, if anybody's using, whoop, there you go, if you have a question, We'll have a few moments to answer them. So if you want to use the question tab on the uh, Zoom browser, you can just submit a question now. We'll be happy to answer them. Uh, we'll take five or 10 minutes to do that. Again, this is your opportunity to speak directly to the FDA. This will not only have a meaningful impact on this day for you to be there and participate and share your experience, this could very well be critical in setting the next 15 years of drug discovery in the field of HCM on the right path. We don't want anybody to waste time, money, and most of all, our well-earned health while we're maintaining it. We want to get good treatments as quickly as possible. We don't want any drug companies to waste money on things that just aren't important to us. This is your chance to tell the drug manufacturers and the FDA what is important to you. Your collective voices must be heard. We need companies to design trials that meet your needs, your family's needs, your grandchildren's needs. And we want to make sure that the FDA is assessing risk and benefit with a full understanding of what it means to be one of us. You know, the federal government and FDA in and of itself can be misunderstood by a lot of people. It is important for all of us to understand there are our voice and they need to hear exactly what's important to us. We want to make sure that drug manufacturers are making drugs that are making us feel better, improving our quality of life, and don't have side effects that make us just not wanna take them. And as anybody who's listening to this who has HCM knows, many of the medications we take have some pretty cumbersome side effects. Wouldn't it be nice if we had targeted therapies that didn't have all of those side effects? Let's try to work with the FDA and with drug manufacturers to develop the best options for us possible. So it's really important that you, you, know, you get involved, you, you participate in person, or you participate online. Please participate and share your experience. You will make the difference for the future. So I don't see any questions coming in. I will give it one more minute before we close out here. We've been going on for 
oh, a good uh, 40, 54 minutes right now. Um, we thought it would take about an hour. We're right there. So thank you for sticking with us, all of those who did. Um, so far, we don't have any open questions. Nothing's been dismissed. Uh, nothing's been answered. So uh, Gwen, Larry, uh, James, any final thoughts or parting comments? No, I think we're, we're really excited to work with this community and work with you. And, um, you know, so, you know, this is uh, a first touch point with everybody, but you know, I would encourage people, if you are mulling this over or thinking about participating, have a question, you know, reach out to Lisa. She's, you know, got the team here. Uh, we can help answer any questions you have, and uh, we hope to, to see you on April 27th. Fantastic. Thank you all very much for your participation. And we look forward to seeing you or seeing you log in with us on April 27th when we share your amazing, important, and impactful statements with the FDA about what it is to live and navigate with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Thank you all for your time today and have a great day.